Hello and welcome back to Curiosity Mine and another instalment in the Opal Word series where we look at the terminology and vernacular of the opal fields and the opal industry, particularly at Lightning Ridge, New South Wales, Australia. In this episode we're digging into opal cutting and opal carving. This video is probably going to be a ton of information so if you want to grab yourself a cup of tea or whatever it is that powers your particular internal combustion engine and settle in for an exploration of opal finishing techniques and some of the words that are used to describe them. I spoke with Vicky and Andrew at Down to Earth Opals at Lightning Ridge. First, we'll speak with Vicky about opal cutting because much like the last Opal Words video, we kind of need to set some benchmarks for the traditional way of doing things before we dive into the newer processes. So I spoke to Vicky about cutting opal. So the traditional way we cut stones is a cabochon, a cabochon also known as a cab. Um, just means that it is, it is an oval shaped commercial cut stone. So this is a good example of a cabochon. It has a medium dome and it can be a long oval or a fat oval. Any type of oval, oval shape is a cabochon. And we'll put a pin in that because we'll come back to more terms around cabochons and traditional opal cutting forms in a future Opal Words video, so stay tuned. Wikipedia provides a pretty concise definition of a cabochon. A cabochon from Middle French caboche or head is a gemstone that has been shaped and polished as opposed to faceted. Now, it is possible to facet opal, but it's really quite uncommon. We actually looked at a couple of faceted pieces of opal from Mexico and from Peru in this video. The main reason that you don't usually see faceted opal is that while opal is famous for its spectacular play of colour, it's actually pretty ordinary when it comes to play of light, or what would be called something like light performance in a diamond or in another type of precious stone that would traditionally be cut into a faceted shape. The purpose of a faceted cut is to capture the reflected light inside the stone and focus it into a bright spot at the centre of the piece, which is pretty much irrelevant with opal because opal's beauty doesn't rely on internally reflected light. It relies on refraction on a microscopic scale between the internal structures of the silicon dioxide that it's comprised of. Also, translucent crystal opal from Lightning Ridge tends to be yellowish in tone and it produces quite dull yellow or beige internal light. So there's not really any benefit to a faceted cut for an opal, particularly opal from Lightning Ridge. So for the longest time, the oval cabochon cut has been the traditional form. Continuing with Wikipedia's definition, the resulting form is usually a convex or rounded obverse with a flat reverse. Cabochon was the default method of preparing gemstones before gemstone cutting was developed, and by cutting, Wikipedia is actually referring to faceting again. Anyway, since time immemorial, the oval-shaped cabochon cut has been the way that opal has been treated. However, a new method of finishing opal has been emerging since about the 1990s and it's been gaining popularity pretty quickly. I spoke with Andrew at Down to Earth Opals about opal carving. But opal being a very natural um, formation does not form in a way where it's conducive to be able to be cut and polished into a calibrated shape or a calibrated size. So calibrated stones are pieces of opal that are cut into oval cabochons of very specific sizes. This is an example of a calibration chart or a calibration guide and the idea is that if you cut your opal to these standardised sizes then they'll always fit into mass manufactured jewellery settings. Back in the heyday of Lightning Ridge Opal, which was the early 80s through to the late 90s, opal cutting became a very industrialised process. So a lot of stones, particularly medium grade and lower grade stones were cut into calibrated shapes because that way they could quickly be set in jewellery and more importantly they could quickly be sold. It would be really rare for a top quality gem opal to be cut into a calibrated shape because you'd simply lose too much of the valuable opal. But for lower grade material calibrated shapes made the opal much more sellable. Opal is an organic stone. Opal really wants to be cut and polished into the shape that it was formed. So about 30 years ago the industry started to take a departure from ovals and rounds and cabs. Initially it went into what we call free shapes and the free shapes were not an oval and not a round but they were a pleasing shape that could be set by a jeweller. A free shape or a free form shape is an opal that's been cut into an organic shape rather than just a round or an oval shape. 
Oval cabochons and freeform shapes are cut on these, which are diamond impregnated wheels. Usually an opal cutter is limited to cutting against the flat surface of the diamond wheel, which makes it very difficult to make unusual freeform shapes. It's certainly possible, but it often involves cutting against the edge of the diamond wheel or using other unusual techniques, and it takes a lot of skill, particularly when it comes to polishing those freeform shapes. And even then, there's a lot of practical limitations on how a freeform stone can be shaped. But with the advent of carving, everything changed. A free shape oval, you could still use the normal lapidary equipment. To carve though, you have to start with a much, much smaller tool and there was nothing invented for opal carving uh, in the opal industry whatsoever. So along came these little guys and they were borrowed from the dental industry. So the dental industry has helped the advent of opal carving about 30 odd years ago. With opal carving essentially what we can do is we can take a piece of rough opal with lots of inclusions and lots of undulations and we can evacuate the clay and the sandstone and the inclusions and sort it all out and maximise the yield but make a truly unique piece of jewellery, um, a truly unique opal uh, that still retains very much the shape that it was when it was originally formed. I asked Andrew to walk us through the basic evolution of opal carving from freeform shapes through to some really complex carvings. What I'd like to show you is, um, I guess, a bit of a graduation. If we look at this opal here, this guy is a free shape. So all done on the lapidary wheel. And you can see that we've been able to maximise the play of colour and really create a, a lovely gemstone that is quite settable uh, by a jeweller, but is also a very, very pleasing shape. It's not an oval, it's not a round, but it's a nice free shape oval. We then go to the next um, opal, which basically has uh, two layers of colour, two colour bars in there. Again, if this was going to be cabbed in the normal sense of the word, that top layer either would be completely gone in order to expose just the bottom layer, or someone would have put the saw through it and maybe turned it into two stones. So this is a free shape, but it is, it is a rudimentary carving in the sense that we've had to, uh, all of these um, angles here, which can't be done on the wheel, have all been done by hand. Um, again, we've maximised the yield, turned it into a very, very pretty stone and created something that is truly unique and still represents the way the opal was originally formed. Andrew has mentioned maximising yield a few times, so let's just quickly unpack that. Opal is valued and sold by the carat, which is a unit of weight that's now equal to one-fifth of a metric gram. The word carat comes from the Greek via Arabic and Italian, and it comes from the word for carob seed, which was once used as a very small unit of measure. A carat used to be one one thousand seven hundred and twenty-eighth of a pound, but now, thankfully, it's one-fifth of a gram. Because opal is sold by weight, the idea when cutting opal is to keep as much of it intact as possible. When you're dealing with gem quality opal that could be worth thousands of dollars per carat, you really don't want to lose any more than you absolutely have to of that stone. So. When you consider the process of cutting a stone from its original rough shape into a standard oval cabochon, you have no choice but to lose a bunch of that valuable weight. But with carving, you don't have to lose those carrots. So that is your maximizing yield. The next level is this little guy here. Crystal opal is by far my favorite um, opal to carve because you usually have got either 100% colour or almost, you know, close to 100% colour. So you can follow the stone, you can follow the undulations and really just sort of let your mind go. Whether it's abstract or figurative doesn't matter. But you can see here that what we've been able to do is create something with some peaks and troughs. Um, it's a really, really funky shape and perfectly finished. With a stone like this, the finish on the opal has to be better than a cut stone because, again, what we're trying to achieve with opal carving is we're trying to achieve a departure from the norm, the norm being 
ovals and rounds and triangles and cushion cuts and so forth. We really want to go out there and, and, and show how opal looks in its natural state, so to speak, um, but just with a little bit of finessing. Take a crystal opal like that and just to prove that yes we can set it into jewellery. This is a carving that I did about a year or so ago, similar material to the one I, I just showed you. This guy again, tiny, I've kept a little bit of potch on the back, but it is a one of a kind, um, stunning carved opal, preserving most of all of the precious colour, but creating something that is just truly unique. And that's where I think over the next probably decade or two, um, carved opal is going to gain a lot of traction in the world because in the jewellery industry there's just too much conformity as far as I'm concerned. And this is unconventional, non-conforming, but if I was after a unique piece of jewellery for myself or a loved one, um, this is exactly the way that I'd be heading. This is the sort of material that is absolutely perfect for carving opal. Big chunk of crystal. You can see that we've still got the sand inclusions in there. It's just very, very roughly being cleaned up. Um, what I've got to do now is I've got to get in there and evacuate all the rest of that sand. The final result uh, will, will be a different shape. It might e even end up becoming two opals, but at the end of the day, even if it becomes two, each one of them is going to have a totally unique shape. Again, inclusion free, crack free, sandstone free. The one thing about carving as opposed to cutting is um, I, take a, I take a stone like this. In order to cut this, it would be cut into multiple small stones and each one of them would just lose the beauty of what you're getting here in, the, in that one large piece. As a really extreme example of how far you can go with carving and how intricate the designs can get, Andrew showed us a unique piece that he carved to accentuate and emphasise the natural formation of this particular piece of opal. One that I did a few years ago, which um, is very much a one of a kind, uh, this is a septarian nodule, which basically started life as a honeycomb within clay. Uh, I think originally they were a mud bubble. So the mud bubble uh, hardened um, and dried out and formed lots of little minute cracks, a bit like a beehive or honeycomb. The silica gel got in there. Under normal circumstances, the, the, the septarian doesn't really have a, much of an internal structure. What, it, what happens with it is that it gets very, very thin and as you try and clean it up, it just sort of disintegrates. But this one had a really neat backbone so to speak and um, there's about 35 hours worth of carving in there every one of those uh, depressions is um, totally scratch free um, under, a, under a jeweler's loop and what I've kept at the bottom is just a little bit of the, the clay just to show the authenticity of where it came from that it's not a made up piece so to speak it hasn't been carved from some big block this is exactly how it formed and really all I've done is just um, take away the sharp edges and, and uh, give it a nice scratch free finish. That piece is absolutely spectacular and it was obviously only ever going to be a candidate for a carving project because there's just not enough material in it to cut into a traditional cut. I had spoken to Andrew previously about opal carving so this is a section from an older interview from a couple of years ago and back then I asked about making the decision between cutting a stone or carving a stone. Are there times when a stone that could be cut into a traditional oval cabochon would lend itself better to being a carving project. Many times um, we will find a rough opal that can be cut and cut relatively easily into the traditional cabochon, whether it be an oval or a round or a free form. But the nature of doing that, we're going to sacrifice too much precious opal. Sometimes you can improve a cut stone and reduce the amount of waste with a few little tweaks. And let me show you one. So here is a classic Lightning Ridge Black Opal. And that could have been easily cut into a traditional shape, probably a free form, but in so doing, we would have actually lost that top dome there. 
So that top would have disappeared and we would have probably lost about two or three carats off that stone. We would have still ended up with a most amazing stone in there, but here we have maximization of yield. Here we have incredible play of color. And I might add, this is a Daniela carving. So Daniela has seen the potential in this stone to be able to maximize its play of color, maximize its value, maximize its carat weight, and just carve into it the little things that we needed to do in order to be able to create an absolutely stunning gem. So that's a crash course on the difference between opal cutting and opal carving and some of the terminology and concepts around both of them. We will come back to look at a few more terms around the shape and structure of finished cut stones in a future video. And there are a ton of terms that we haven't even looked at yet. So please feel free to subscribe if you're afraid that you might miss out on those. If there's any words, opal mining words, terms, phrases, or anything that you'd like more information on, please leave a comment and we will investigate those in a future video. This video was made with the help of Down to Earth Opals at Lightning Ridge, with special thanks to Vicky and Andrew for their time and talent. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. The links are in the description. And thank you for watching.